Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I'm Nina Shea. I direct the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute here in Washington. And today we're going to be talking about the softest of the soft power actions going on to claim basic civil liberties in Iran. And um, we're going to start today by addressing the compulsory hijab protests that have been going on for quite some time, but gained um, some publicity earlier this year um, in the international media. And um, it would seem that, um, that this is a most personal act, this unraveling of one's own headscarf and discarding it. Um, but in fact, it and other um, similar efforts are really potent revolutionary acts. Um, the headscarf, of course, is uh, one of the foremost symbols of the Islamic revolution in Iran. It's a symbol of power and legitimacy of the ayatollahs and Islamic rule. It is a symbol of the oppression of women and, um, and, to, uh, and to the larger society. Uh, the, to defy the headscarf is a singular act of courage. A, a woman does so and risks a, a woman who does so risks arrest, imprisonment, job loss, lashings, being beaten on the street. Um, the Ayatollahs, interestingly enough, try to downplay the significance of this movement in January um, by calling it infantile. Um, but last month, the Supreme Leader, Khamenei, underscored the stakes for the regime in a, a speech he gave on women. He said, the Islamic regime takes no issue with a woman who doesn't wear the hijab in her home or when meeting a stranger in her home. However, what is done in public influences the public. The regime that arose in accordance with Islam must confront this. If something is forbidden, it doesn't matter whether it is a small issue or a large issue. What is forbidden, according to religious law, must not be done in public because Islamic law and the regime have determined that forbidden acts in public must be prevented. So um, these, our guests today, our speakers, are three extremely impressive Iranian-American women um, I believe that they hold out the best hope for peaceful evolution, um, for a free society in Iran. Um, I think that um, the West not only can help their efforts uh, by paying attention, but should do so. And religious freedom advocates, um, a world in which I am <coughs> immersed in, um, and Ambassador uh, Sam Brownback, our ambassador at large for religious freedom at the State Department, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom Congress, should be paying attention. This is a religious freedom issue. It's fundamentally a religious freedom issue. Um, it's against the coercion um, of a religion. Um, and um, this is relevant in Iran because Iran is a type of theocracy. So um, our guest speakers today are um, Masi Ali Najad. She is founder of, um, and Masi is in the middle. She is uh, the founder of My Stealthy Freedom Campaign. Uh, she has been written about in the New York Times and Amnesty International. And um, very excited to hear the latest in that movement. Uh, which I have been following on the, the internet, and I hope you have too. Um, our second speaker is going to broaden out to talk about um, what she knows um, from a scholarly perspective, as well as a personal perspective on civil liberties and civic society. That's Meranjis Kar. Um, and Meranjis, I had the privilege of co authoring a book on radical Islam's rules about 13 years ago uh, that was edited by my colleague, Dr. Paul Marshall. <laughs> and then um, wrapping up the formal presentations is my old colleague, uh, Mariam Amar Sadegi, 
Uh, we worked together at Freedom House um, a, over a decade ago. <laughs> And she has also a very exciting campaign to promote um, greater depth of knowledge about civil liberties and freedom um, in the Tavana um, online e-educational project. So please join me in welcoming our speakers today. And Masik, go ahead, take it from here. So I don't know why you start from me. <laughs> um, Thank you for um, inviting me to be here with you. Um, you know, I just want to start from my personal story to give you, uh, you know, a broader um, window that why hijab is important. I grew up in a small village to traditional family. And I remember that I had to wear hijab even inside my house as well. Why? Because I was told it's not a big issue. It's just a small issue. Because I grew up in a poor family, and every time when I wanted to talk about hijab, there were like people's family, my parents, everyone saying that, you know, thinking about um, bread, money, it's more important than hijab. And then we had, um, you know, revolution. We had war. Then we had sanction. So anytime when we wanted to talk about hijab and personal freedom, there were people saying, shh, it's not the right time because we had sanction, we had revolution, we had war, so let's solve bigger problem. And then we're gonna talk about hijab. So I am used to hear no in my life. And I found that, that when I get found my own power to say no, then it's, it's the beginning. Then you have the power to say no to any kind of discrimination or oppression. So that's why it just started from my own experience that I was the one in a small village, having a black and white TV and listening to the government of Iran. All I was watching, it was clerics, mullahs, all the you know, TV broadcasting. So I had to listen to them. But now, they are listening to me. <laughs> so it's not about me. It's about millions of Iranian women, ordinary women. They found the power. They found the platform to not being just a listener. And that is why I think hijab is important, because we are taking our visibility back. We are taking our uh, voice back. When you turn on the TV, it's all about the women in black, women, the women in hijab, which I have to say, all the female in my family, they wear hijab. But we want to be, you know, have the same freedom, and we want to be in Iran, both, all together, with or without hijab. So to just make it clear that why I picked the issue, because it was a personal, story it was there was the philosophy behind it the story behind it helped me to understand that even here in america some people are worried about you know if they talk about hijab because now hijab is more trendy than uh, taking off hijab here in america they might say shh it's not a good time because donald trump is around i was saying that look i've been told all my life it's not a good time so every time is a good time to talk about hijab so i talk uh, i i uh, from the beginning, I launched my selfie freedom, but it was all about inviting women to talk about their personal experience, like publishing a photo of themselves, but talking about it. And then it, it was like, from the beginning, they started to, the government of Iran, some activists, they started to uh, ignore us, that this is nothing, you know? They totally ignored us. Then, when our campaign got bigger, they started to attack us, to humiliate us. But now they recognize that we are all together and we are stronger. So they're all talking about hijab. So how? From the beginning, it was just a picture, the power of picture, which you never seen in Iranian official media. It's about hair. It's, it's about a small issue, which when you talk about it, it's a red line for the government of Iran. But everything that we hear is just, there, there are three pillars for Islamic Republic of Iran is important. Death to Israel, <clears throat> death to America, and then hijab. But I found that from the beginning, when I, went, when I launched my campaign, my stealthy freedom, I got attacked by the government of Iran on Iranian safety when they said that Masi was raped in London by three men. It was a big lie. Why? Because they thought, you know, to, they can discredit a, a woman when they say that you were raped. So I went to the embassy in London, and they didn't let me in just because I didn't have hijab. 
And then here in, in, in uh, Washington, D.C., I went to intersection here. They didn't let me in without hijab. So instead, when I insist, they called the Secret Service. So you see, the biggest enemy for the Islamic Republic of Iran is not the United States of America. They can ask help for Secret Service to the police of America <laughs> to prevent a woman, unveiled woman, to enter to their homeland. That is why, for me, I think it's, it's obvious that the, you know, when they say that death to America, death to Israel, but the first, the most, you know, biggest enemy for Islamic Republic of Iran is a woman who has the power to say no. So then I decided, after my selfie freedom, I, I decided to uh, shift the online uh, movement to something offline, in public. And uh, some people might say that, so you're going to put people, uh, women inside Iran in danger. I have to say that when I heard the news that within a year, 3.6 million women were stopped in the street, warned, sent to the court, and arrested. Why? These were not the women joining my campaign. These were the women who were having inappropriate hijab. So they all, you know, were in danger already before joining my campaign. And then there were 40,000 cars were impounded within eight months. Why? Because the drivers were just driving unveiled inside the car. So they are in danger. It's the Islamic Republic of Iran putting them in danger. It's not me. So I, I invited the women that now pick a color. I picked white because I thought it's the color of peace. And then I picked the day Wednesday because I was more, uh, you know, free on Wednesday. I could do whatever <laughs> I want. So <laughs> this is how we launch a revolution, a woman's revolution. See what day is free day and you can, you know, overthrow the regime. So I called the women to come and join together to identify each other in public. Why? Because of the personal, personal freedom. So I was shocked because instead of getting just pictures of women from like, inside Iran wearing a white headscarf, they all took the, off their white headscarf, walking in public and, and protesting against compulsory hijab. And that is called White Wednesday. In one Wednesday, 27th December, there was Vida Mubahed. She came up with her, with her own idea, putting the headscarf on a stick, jumping on a platform, waving headscarf in, in. She's up, she's up on the yes. screen there. Yeah. So this brave woman is the, you know, Rosa Parks of Iran. Mm -hmm. So she's doing a punishable crime. She got arrested, and we don't know what to do. We don't know her name. We didn't know what happened to her. I just created a hashtag called, where is the girl of Revolution Street? Because I, I only received a video from a man saying that, I saw this woman on Wednesday uh, waving headscarf. I didn't know her. So I had to name her something. So I called her the girl from the Revolution Street. That's all. In one day, we got 19,000 tweets. Yes, the government of Iran have guns and bullets. They have power, prison. They have money. But we have hashtag. We have Twitter. We have Facebook. So we get together on the same umbrella. That's how we get powerful. And we all started to ask, where is the girl of, Revolu the girl of Revolution Street? What happened? She found by Nasrin Sotudeh a well-known lawyer, lawyer inside Iran. But the most important thing happened. Other women started to be the girl of revolution. The, girl of, the girls of Revolution Street in Iran was another brave act against compulsory hijab. So they, were, they arrested 29 hijab protesters. Then I had to find another way what to do to put, be less dangerous for the women inside Iran. So I called them. You know, every day with your husband, with your brother, with your family. Every day can be Wednesday. And each of you can be a girl of revolution. So I, I created another hashtag called walking unveiled. So women started to walk unveiled in public with their families. Mm -hmm. The videos every day give me goosebumps. But through this walking unveiled, we found that, that men attacking us, those who think that they have to make every individual person the same as Islamic Republic of Iran, forcing them to wear hijab, starting to harassing women, telling them what to wear. You know, I just said that, look, in London, there was a guy, Iranian guy, in the, in the airport. He just came to me and he said, you ugly women are uh, trying to ruin the face of Islamic Republic. Uh, no, he said that you ugly women 
is ruining the face of Iran, our country. And I said, but first, I'm not ugly. I see myself beautiful. <laughs> so, <laughs> because they use that. This is the way that push you back as a woman. They think it's important to attack your sexuality or saying that you're ugly, so you're going to be scared. I said, no. This is my camera. You called me ugly. Call me right now in front of my camera. And I am not ruining the face of my country. I'm ruining the face of Islamic Republic of Iran and the discriminatory laws. So tell that I'm ugly here. Tell that on my camera. So he didn't say anything. So, and I published that on my Instagram. I said, look, this is my weapon. He didn't say anything when my camera was on. Use that. They have weapon. The morality police beaten up you. The morality police attack you. Use your mobile phone. So, and then I received a lot of videos under another hashtag called my camera is my weapon. So you heard about the woman got beaten up by morality police. That was happening to us for 40 years. Now I think Mehrangis Kar can tell you that the flag, the white flag, it, it's like an Olympic torch, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Which was handed from one generation to other generation. And, and, and now this gen generation is out of control <laughs> just because of the social media. They know how to, um, how to resist compulsory hijab because they know this is the beginning. This is the first step toward full equality. And they know to, to teach the rest of the world actually how to resist because now we are facing another problem. In Iran, we know how to tell the government of Iran. I mean, if you're a woman from Iran, you don't believe in compulsory hijab, and you're told uh, uh, some, anything that they tell you not to do, we know how to do it. So now we are keep hearing in the West, shh, it's not an important issue. In the Middle East, there are bigger problems. Let's solve bigger problems and get, you know, uh, then we get back to hijab. So, and if I have time, then in the panel, I'm going to tell you that why now the biggest problem is here. When we, they invite Jabad Zarif, they invite President Rouhani with the biggest smile, all the Western media give them the, a platform, and they never understand that. When you give them a platform without listening to this woman, now none of us know what happened to Vidam of Ahed. Why? Because for the media here, it's not trendy. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going no, to talk no, about you, you're, you're right. And when I was trying to find um, an image uh, to display on our, site, on our screen here today, um, I could not find a single professional uh, news agency photo of any of the women that are on your website and your Twitter feed. And really, um, if you haven't seen Masid's Twitter feed, you must. Some of the most moving images are, uh, one of the most moving ones for me was um, an older woman in uh, hijab and black chador who uh, used a cane to climb up on the base of a fountain and wave another hijab. She didn't take hers off because she wanted to wear the hijab, but she was in solidarity with the women who didn't want to. That was amazing. But I have to tell you that when Mehrangi's car in Iran was uh, promoting like um, feminism activities. I was scared to talk about feminism. It was a taboo in Iran. So, and then when she left Iran, people like her, when they were talking about like taboo feminism movement, inside Iran, we were just getting the courage. Sometimes when we are here and we have the platform, we are free to talk about it, and then we keep hearing, shh, it's not a good time because you're outsider. That hurts us. So I think that would be good if... Um, Mayrangi, is such a great segue. Please oh. stay. <laughs> Thank Please. you. Thank you for having me. And uh, oh. uh, I would like to uh, talk a little about uh, hijab, uh, mandatory hijab, not just hijab. <laughs> That's important mm -hmm. because a big part of Iranian women, uh, they wear hijab, but it's not um, by force. Uh, they believe that and they like that. This is not something that uh, we are talking <laughs> against that, against the women who they wear hijab. 
uh, without uh, force of government. So the issue that I would like to talk about that is mandatory hijab. And uh, my generation give me, give me permission to talk about that when it was happened during uh, revolution. After uh, victory of Islamic revolution 40 years ago, immediately uh, Ayatollah Khomeini ordered uh, for hijab. And uh, unfortunately, a big part of people inside and outside Iran, young generation, sometimes uh, governments, sometimes uh, human rights uh, and women's rights institution outside Iran, uh, they think that immediately after Ayatollah Khomeini ordered to mandatory hijab, every Iranian woman who had not hijab, uh, they obeyed and they weared hijab. But this is not true. Historically, this is not true. And all the time, I would like um, talk and say uh, to younger generation like uh, uh, Masi and others that please, when you are talking at, uh, about uh, mandatory hijab, you explain that uh, Iranian people, uh, they didn't obey that immediately. And uh, it took three years that Iranian women, they did do that. And I was witnessing all of these uh, periods. When he ordered hijab, uh, women who had not hijab, women uh, who, who were educated, women who were working uh, in uh, governmental offices or in some other uh, field, uh, they shocked because they were follower Khomeini, unfortunately. And sometimes in uh, demonstration, uh, revolutionary demonstration, uh, they, they veered hijab for having harmony with all traditional people who they had been revolutionary at the time. This was a big mistake of Iranian women. And when we are talking about something like that, we should remember that we made mistake. And without that, after victory of revolution, you know, they take off the hijab and everything would be like before. And during Shah, hijab was uh, choice, uh, and there was no mandatory for hijab. Uh, and uh, after Khomeini, uh, as you know, I think everything about that, uh, it was uh, change, an issue that it, uh, the uh, police, moral police and patrol all uh, over the street, they were uh, looking and watching uh, for any women who had not hijab or their hijab was not perfect. But three years passed after uh, Khomeini order. This is something that uh, uh, I would like to talk about that to you. Uh, women had demonstration, organized a very big demonstration in the building of the uh, judiciary system, and I had been there, and I was witnessing, uh, and uh, nobody uh, could attack them because, uh, you know, the people, the people was huge. But after they left the building, 
something happened and uh, somebody they attacked them, but uh, it was not a lot. After that, we do have some other demonstration all over the uh, country, uh, but it was not unified because they suppressed everything and uh, after that they couldn't have um, good organization, good civil society because when they suppressed and they, they were afraid that uh, uh, it changed to a very, a very powerful uh, movement, they cannot control that. They suppressed everything and uh, 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 I do have some sources that uh, some women uh, were killed in uh, some part of country um, for fighting uh, with police for hijab. Uh, and this history is full of struggle. But you didn't see that because the social media was not like this. Because Iran was very closed, and uh, reporter, foreign reporter, they had not permission allowed going to Iran. So, uh, because I don't have a lot of a lot of time for talking about a long history, just I want to say that this is not a new issue. This is an old issue. And ordinary women in Iran, they struggle more than activists, believe me. Because individually, they were fighting with patrol police. And sometimes I was witnessing that they, they are beating, <coughs> beating each other <coughs> Sorry. Before, before they arrest them. So, if somebody uh, want to uh, write this history, you could understand that uh, uh, this is uh, the first opposition, civic opposition against Islamic Republic. And it was continuous, but sometimes it was interrupted because the war between Iran and Iraq that took eight years. And in these eight years, like any country that they are in war, something like women's rights, human rights, and some other thing like that, it was marginalized. And the people just, they were going for having, uh, you know, having food, having cigarette, and they were um, staying on the line for you know survival. That's it. And the government, uh, they could stop everything, like any government who are who is in war, on war with somebody, some country or something. <clears throat> I don't know. So this struggle stopped because of war, but not individually. Individually, the struggle uh, was continuous between, between women and patrol and the moral police. After that, again, again after, uh, after the end of war between Iran and Iraq, uh, we were facing with uh, some new uh, opportunity and we use that, like uh, publishing some magazine. Uh, and for example, uh, Zanon magazine, women magazine. And it was uh, very moderate, but uh, the editor of that uh, uh, was very revolutionary woman, uh, but became angry of something that happened against uh, women's rights. And uh, I cannot I cannot forget that when she invited me as a secular uh, woman uh, to work with that magazine, I could understand that something in Iran is on the way. And uh, after that, something happened, like reform, 
uh, and uh, during reform, uh, we could have uh, some uh, women's rights NGO. Before that, we didn't have a strong NGO or women rights NGO because uh, uh, they didn't uh, give us permission uh, and license, legal license for that. Uh, during uh, reform, uh, women's rights show, showed itself in NGOs and uh, in cam <coughs> after that, during Ahmadinejad, Ahmadinejad stopped everything uh, that we achieved during Khatami. It was a very weak uh, civil society. And uh, he could attack that, and after that, women's rights uh, uh, activists, they organized campaigns, one million signature, no to, uh, uh, no to stoning and something else, and they, they, um, they came to the streets, and uh, they had a slogan uh, for equality between men and women, and uh, they suppressed everything, and now, Many of these campaigns uh, uh, leaders, they are outside the country, and some of them, they are inside the country, and they are silent. But I am uh, very happy to say that we do have very good capacity inside and outside Iran, and I really appreciate Masih Alinejad, uh, for establishing uh, a new uh, campaign and used very good uh, of social media and uh, television that Iranian people now they can watch it. Uh, then if you have some question, I'm ready. Great, thank for, you. And uh, that's uh, also a wonderful segue into Mariam's uh, uh, statement regarding how social media changed a lot. May not change everything, but it changed a lot in, in this movement. So Mariam, can you tell us yeah. what the, uh, the freedoms and limitations of social media are and what you're trying to do? Sure. It's, first of all, I want to say it's wonderful to be an, on an all-woman panel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, Nina, I'm very grateful to you in particular, of course. Um, I've always learned from you. We've, we've known each other since 2005, and I've always looked up to you. And, and I appreciate this opportunity very much. And Khanu Mekar has been, has been somebody that we've all admired for so long. And she uh, has been working with us, teaching at Tavana since we launched Tavana. She was one of the very first people to, to believe in us and trust us. And, and we're so grateful for that. And of course, Masi. We had breakfast together this morning at our house, and we took a long walk. And uh, as she was talking, I, I, I just kept trying not to cry because it, it's, it's, it's so wonderful, everything that she has achieved um, and that she has helped everybody else to achieve. And we're so, um, we're so fortunate to have been working with Messi for uh, a few years, really, now at Tavana. And it's a, it's a wonderful partnership. and. Uh, it couldn't be better, and I'm just so happy that we are all here like this. Uh, I think that uh, this, as Messi said, this is the this is the biggest weapon. This is the biggest fear. This is the biggest power against the Islamic Republic. I also want to thank my mom, who's in the audience, because Mrs. Carr mentioned that women in in the early days of the revolution, women came out on the streets and they protested against hijab. They came out for a few days. Of course, they were a very small minority. They were beaten up. They did not succeed. They have not succeeded for 40 years. For 40 years, a very repressive regime continues to stifle the hopes and, and dreams of Iranian women. But my mom was there, and I'm very proud of her. <laughs> um, so thank you for also for being here and for hearing us and for caring about this issue, because as the people of Iran are finally positioned to take on their tyrants, very few people are paying attention. The major news networks are consumed with Stormy Daniels, and even more respectable media are preoccupied with day-to-day -day intrigues of the administration rather than world developments that will shape our future. 
the world's most repressive regimes are very happy about what we are choosing to write and think and talk about as a free society. So I'm grateful to Hudson for taking seriously the protests in Iran. They're important to the Iranian people, their livelihood, freedom, dignity, the future of Iranian children. But they are also important because they hold, they hold within them the profound potential for a more free, peaceful, and prosperous Middle East region that is genuinely one with liberal values and liberal interests, open to the world, and ready to go forward, not backward, ready to excel, not terrorize. It's not a surprise, frankly, that, that a right-wing think tank, I say this as someone who's only once in her life voted for a Republican, it's no surprise that a right-wing think tank is taking seriously the threat from Iran to its own people, to the region, to the United States, to Israel, to, civ to civilization. It, that's not a surprise. But it's also not a surprise that a right-wing think tank is taking seriously the struggle of Iranian women. Because the universality of the feminist cause has been abandoned by large segments of the left. The old sisterhood, remember sisterhood is global, has become more of a tribal smugness about insignificant issues, think microaggressions, that don't speak even to women's real issues here in the United States, much less in the world that is not free and democratic, that is plagued by Islamist politics, and in the case of Iran, a full-blown Islamist theocracy that's been rotting in power for four decades. Among Western feminists, overwhelmingly, not only is there no commitment to amplifying voices of those struggling for their most basic rights in places like Iran, there is an unspoken shame in it, as if taking off the headscarf is something more to ignore than to celebrate. Protecting those who wear the headscarf is something considered something progressive in America today, with little regard to all the small and big denials of freedom, equality, fairness that go into that so-called choice even among those living inside Western democracies. So it's no surprise, really, that as women are, despite fierce repression, coming out in every part of Iran to demand their dignity and freedom, we who work to support them from the United States are not invited to speak at think tanks of the left. Those think tanks just aren't paying this much heed. Hollywood isn't. The universities aren't. International media is barely noticing. Javad is that if they will listen to, but not the women. The truth is there is a revolution going on. It's a revolution for liberal ideals, for decency, for fairness, for individual rights, and against the medieval revolution of 1979 that was anti-West, anti-liberal, anti-secular, anti-woman, and anti-Iranian. It's against an anti-modern revolution that postmodern political theorists like Foucault exalted and a system of government that many on the left still have trouble condemning because it's a totalitarianism rooted in Islam and a totalitarianism like so many that is rooted in populist revolt. It's as if the subjugation of women, the executions, the persecution of the Baha'i, the stifling of every creative impulse and free thought, stealing from the people such that regime families today drive around in Ferraris these are people who made a revolution in the name of the Mustaz Af'in. These are people who talked about how terrible Qarb Zadegi is, West toxification. <laughs> they are driving around in Ferraris and Lamborghinis while people do not have enough to eat. Middle class Iranians barely have enough to eat now. Taghutia. Who are the Taghutis now? Say that the Khamenei's mafia is the Taghutis and they are stealing the wealth of the, of the Iranian people to go and annihilate innocent children in Syria, in Yemen. And then they wonder why people say, the one of the chants in, uh, in Kazarun, Friday oh. prayers, Friday prayers, religious people going to Friday prayers in Iran, turn their backs to the Friday prayer leader and say, our backs are to the enemy, are, are, we are facing the nation. Mm. <coughs> it's as if these things are something to be proud of. It's, it's, it's as if all of these things are some to be, something to be proud of. It's as if there's something about the Islamic Republic that is indigenous and good and right and even a source of pride a pride embodied more than anything else in the smile of Jawad Zarif, because it is a regime opposed to the West, 
It wears the garb of authenticity and faith. It speaks the language of anti-imperialism and anti-Americanism, of Palestinian liberation and justice for the downtrodden. The truth is that the left, the, where I come from, I, I still hold one foot firmly on the left for social liberation, civil liberties, equality, social justice, labor rights, environment, education. The left will not care about the working class in Iran. It is the biggest irony that I have seen in the last 40 years of watching how the international community reacts to what is happening inside the country. The working class of Iran, the labor force of Iran is, is revolting. The Mustaz Afin are revolting against the Islamic Republic and the labor organizations around the world, the, the left-leaning parties around the world are closing their eyes very willfully. Those people have been betrayed by the left in the international community. They don't care. People in Iran don't care if it's the right or the left that is going to be in solidarity with them. They don't care who Donald <laughs> Trump is as a person. They care that he's the president of the United States of America. And the people of Iran need our support now more than, more than ever. What they don't want is somebody like Mogherini, who, when everybody is tweeting at her to come and make a statement, Make a statement to support the Girls of Revolution Street. Make a statement to support the, the, the working class that's revolting in over 80 cities and towns across the country. She turns the other way. It's obvious what those negotiations were about. They were about rapprochement with the regime. Otherwise, why wouldn't somebody like Mogherini say, this is the change we want. If Iran can become a democracy, who cares about the nuclear negotiations? This is... There's a lot at stake here, and for, for years now, for at least four or five years, the Iranian regime, directly and indirectly, has been telling the Iranian people, be careful, be careful. If you go too far, your country will become like Syria. In that, in that is an implicit threat. If you go too far and you, if you demand too much, if you want to actually breathe and live in freedom, we will do to you what we did to the people of Syria. We will annihilate this country, too. So it's not as though, and, and, and what's really bad is that, the, is that that message has been echoed outside of the country by groups like the National Iranian American Council. The National Iranian American Council, Trita Parsi, instead of being on the side of the Iranian people, instead of being on the side of the struggle for democracy and human rights, has echoed that and, and continues even now tweeting in the last week, oh, I'm really scared about these women coming out and being the videos of these women being, being beaten up. Because if people see these w videos of the women being beaten up, Saudi Arabia and Israel and the United States will take advantage of it. And all hell will break loose, and we will lose our country. Um, this really was not supposed to be Iran's movement. There was a lot that was m m working against the Iranian people. For one thing, they saw what's happening in Syria. Of course, it's a lot to be afraid of. The Iran deal, none of us really thought things were going to go this way. Those who said that the Iran deal is going to bring peace will obviously not look at Syria. Syria is the direct result of the Iran deal and, what, and how the Obama administration basically gave away that country to the Islamic Republic. But it also, we were also wrong who opposed the Iran deal in this sense that we didn't think that this regime would be this stupid, that when they get these huge cash payments from the West, they're going to actually take it, put it in their own pocket, and then whatever's left, give to Assad so that he can continue killing those people. We didn't think they would be this stupid that they would not address the severe economic crisis inside the country. So it's against this backdrop that we need to see the significance of what is happening with these brave women and, and, and all, the many other kinds of civic protests going on. This is not 1989. There is no wave of countries falling towards liberal democracy, free markets, and open societies. There is a global democratic recession, in fact. Many years in the making now in Russia, China, Turkey, et cetera, are consolidating their fiercely undemocratic rule learning from each other, helping each other, feeling emboldened, and seeping into our societies, our free societies, in ways never imaginable during the Cold War. So there's lots of reasons to be fearful, but there's also lots of reasons to be extremely impressed with what people inside Iran are doing. Um, can I have one more minute? Yeah, okay. 
Okay. And then one more minute. Okay, one more minute. It's very important to understand the game that Khamenei has been playing for a long time now. He presents to the outside world this thing about hardliners versus moderates, hardliners versus softliners. Okay, this is really not this is really not the main issue. By doing this, what he what he's doing is saying, here are the reformists, so-called reformists. Are you going to vote for them or not? The real division in Iranian society are, is between the people who are willing to vote and the people who are not willing to vote. What the significance of the, the recent protests in Iran is that both of these people, both of these segments of society are calling out the reformists more than anyone else and saying, shame on you. Not only have you not made anything better, you're making it worse. We're finished with all of you. So can I add something? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the most important thing is when we hear people saying, shh, this is not the right time to talk about it, especially the left, it breaks my heart. Because we don't ask anyone to come and rescue the women of Iran. We are brave enough to rescue ourselves. But the problem is we want to rescue the Western women who go to my country. We want to make them understand that they stand up for your own dignity. You know what happened? <laughs> when the Western feminists, when the Swedish feminists mocked Donald Trump's cabinet by taking a picture of all female ministers, I said, yes, that's important to show the power of women. That picture made my day. Then later, those uh, feminist ministers all went to Iran. The picture was like doing this, all wearing hijab. And I said, First, you were showing Donald Trump that men and women are equal. Now you're showing the Islamic Republic of Iran, well, men are more equal than women. That breaks my heart. And then when we started to invite all the media around the world, join us, talk about this. Because when Burkini ban happened, my campaign was the, you know, had the loudest voice to condemn Burkini ban. Because we wanted to stand with the you know, Muslim minority in French. Let them have choice. When Muslim ban happened in America, I was the one who took the street and condemned Muslim ban. Because the, the first wall was built by Islamic Republic of Iran, which kicked us out. And Muslim ban affect only the people of Iran. Because you see all the governments, their children, they are here. Masume Ebtekar, the one who was involved in taking hostage. Her, her son is here. But I cannot see my son. Musavian. All of them. So many. And All they of had them. their visas under the Obama administration when our families were being denied. So there I can no reason for that, it. That's the reason that I said, look, I condemn Muslim ban. I condemn Burkini ban. And I ask the feminist, the Western feminist, Linda Sarsour, the ministers to condemn compulsory hijab when you go to Iran. What happened, they come up with a new idea, which is amazing. They said that wearing headscarves, it's part of Iranian culture. How come? Because Jabal Zarif educate you. Condemning compulsory hijab is not that difficult because we say that we want to have the same freedom as those women who wear hijab. So how come forcing a seven-year-old girl became suddenly part of the Iranian culture before the revolution, as Mehrangi's car you know, illustrated very well, that women had the choice whether they want to wear it or not. So it cannot be part of our culture. So the Western feminists said, oh, OK, so this is a small issue. Hey, they don't even let you to go inside Iran for a small issue. So you don't have even the opportunity to solve bigger problems when you do not obey this small issue. And the most important thing, that when, you're, when you don't have the control of your head, how <laughs> this government are going to give you, you know, the control of what's going on inside your head. <laughs> so it's not a small issue. Keep the sisterhood. And as I want to really express myself, we don't want the Western women come and save us. But we don't want you to legitimize a discriminatory law by when these women putting themselves in danger and risking their lives, when the high representative of European Parliament go there, you have tourists, they go there. 
So let's just get together. Condemn Muslim ban, Burkini ban, and compulsory hijab. But when you do not condemn, when you go to Iran, you obey compulsory hijab, and then you come outside, you condemn Burkini ban, you condemn Muslim ban, you are a hypocrite. That's all I want to say. Let's, um, let's move to questions. Um, we're almost out of time. Yes, Barbara Slavin. Thank you very much. Thank you for the discussion. I'm Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council. Um, I wanted to ask really the, about the topic of today's event, which is how we can help the women in Iran, apart from retweeting the videos, uh, writing blog posts about this. Um, what more are you looking for? And is there a concern that, I mean, I don't think Donald Trump is ever going to talk about this. Let's face it. This is, you know, he doesn't seem to care very much about human rights. So um, who should be the the spokespeople about this in the United States. How do we make sure that we don't make things uh, worse for people? One other thing, and that is I think it should be noted, and I haven't been in Iran for four years, but it should be noted that, that hijab has changed <laughs> in Iran hugely, and it really is observed uh, in very token fashion, in, in particularly in Tehran now, and particularly by young people. So it's no longer the the black chador and it's no longer it's We're still it's about our dignity. I mean it's How still horrible wear? it's still horrible no, but it's less wear, suffocating can you wear a colorful headscarf and sit here for for one hour no of course not I hate it no, I mean I've done it the but I hate it. behind it anyway so I'm just yeah, we're, just pointing we're, out that it has principle, changed. It's a matter of principle, really, and, and the fact um, that just two years ago there were 7,000 new religious police put on to patrol bad head jobs. So, you know, it's still, and, it, and again, you know, poor, poor Vida, where is she today? Does anyone well, know? So, so again, the, the question is how, how we us can help. And, and if I could just say one thing to Mariam, it's possible to support the JCPOA and support an end to mandatory okay, hijab right, well, at the same time. Let's just time. deal with the Thanks. question. All right, fine. Can I Go ahead. Say, uh, can I just say, uh, Barbara Slavin's point is very much the Islamic Republic's point. It's what Khamenei says. It's, it's so much better now. Look at what we gave you. You can take it back to here. You can make it colorful. You can walk like this. You can talk like that. We're talking about human rights. We're talking about people's human rights. That's patronizing. That's, a, that's, 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 that's the worst thing that you can say, I think, to people who are struggling and helping those who are struggling for something that where they are risking they are risking imprisonment they are risking torture their their families suffer every time they go out but they they take these risks it's not the time for that kind of argument frankly which has always been the, the Islamic republic how argument. can you help how, can, well, how help? can what can we help how can we help one one thing we can do right now especially as the economic situation has worsened so much is to tighten the pressure on the, on, the, on the regime as much as possible economically. I know you don't agree, Barbara, because Atlanta Council and so many other groups around town have, been, have, have always worked to take the sanctions off of Iran. But really, this is the time, this is the time to tighten the screws, not to, uh, not to let them breathe more freely. This is the time to put pressure on, and that's what people inside the country are saying, too. Um, there are other things that are practical, like banning uh, Islamic Republic uh, international broadcasting. It's a, it's a big hashtag. It's a big ask. It's something that the Trump administration can and should do. We need to completely, either completely cancel Voice of America. I know they're here. Either completely cancel Voice of America or fundamentally change it so that it is actually working toward the benefit for the benefit of the Iranian people and the struggle for democracy and human rights it is not that right now severely mismanaged severely mismanaged uh, and you know <laughs> yeah okay and then the the democracy program that was started under the Bush administration that continues under the Obama administration uh, really supported very watered down programming that needs to now change. We have a new administration, and, w and more importantly, we have a new reality on the ground. We need hard-hitting programs that are focused on democratic change, not female entrepreneurship, not environmental protection, not breast cancer, not eight circumvention tools for Iran. Iran doesn't need another circumvention tool. Iran doesn't need another app that just a few thousand people download and then never use. Iran needs hard-hitting democracy programming or nothing. We'd really rather have nothing. <laughs> yeah. no, no, there are other people that want to ask questions, Barbara. Yes, go ahead. Back, back there. 
Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Zara Sadepur from the Women's Freedom Forum. Uh, we are an organization in education um, uh, across the country here in the U.S., We're concentrating on the Middle East, specifically in Iran. Um, speaking to um, Messi, if you don't mind calling you by your first name, um, Scar, and also Maryam, the good point that you had mentions about the hijab and the mandatory veiling of the Iranian women, which is a very obviously uh, legit issue here. Um, only three days after the victory of the re revolution, the first decree of the government was for women to cover their head. Um, Having said that, with Vida and all the other women that have come, the 29 that were arrested, obviously, we all know, um, as Miriam said, it is, seems it is a part of a bigger picture uh, when it comes to Iran. Is The hijab, obviously, is very important. It's a symbolic version. It is the cho should be choice of a woman, obviously. But I think these women are in the streets, most likely, not most likely, as you had mentioned, is a bigger picture of the economic, economic issue. Almost 40 years, they are, the women are uh, leading these demonstrations and protests. And how the West responds to it, you, all of you have mentioned different scenarios, different um, entities or personnel or countries that have traveled and their responses and what we should be. I guess my question is that um, how do you think uh, this whole fundamentally this can change? Women can be empowered as Maryam and Messi have you mentioned, is not just one dimensional of the hijab. It is the whole theocracy. Mm -hmm. The women are the first victim of this regime, were the ones that were stoned. Remember, this is the regime that is stoned. Can you frame women. the question? And, and I guess uh, my question is that do you think, um, beside the hijab issue, what other things that can be done to, to some degree, Maryam addressed that? I would like to hear it from perhaps Messi and Scar as to how do you think we should address this issue? Okay. Obviously, so there is no moderation in this beyond, regime. Beyond like the hijab, it. what other issues? Should okay, if, if I, if, if I uh, understood well, I don't know. Uh, of course, uh, behind the hijab uh, is something else because after uh, Islamic revolution, it was not hijab that was by force. Uh, uh, the uh, Iranian uh, women uh, lost all uh, positive law uh, that during Shah we had, mm. like uh, reform in uh, family, <coughs> law, like uh, sitting as a judge, and uh, like some other position that uh, they were able to get it. So we cannot, but we can say. Uh, that this theory uh, that hijab is a symbol of all inequality, it is something that, uh, you know, Iranian women and particularly young uh, generation, they could understand. And that's why the priority for them now is hijab. But hijab is a symbol of something that they have lost and they demand more than that for their future. It's also the first domino, actually. I, I see it as a first domino that could uh, lead to uh, the end of male guardianship or uh, inequality in the courts. The, the or, right uh, to divorce. Marriage in, in age nine by the male guardian. All of those rights, and then off and to the broader. A lot of in Islamic, uh, Islamic penal code full of discrimination mm -hmm. between men and women and uh, every other discrimination that now we cannot mention all of them. Mm -hmm. It's very important because by itself it's important, but, but as Masi said, Vida Mubahid is like the Rosa Parks of Iran because when Rosa Parks sat where she wanted to sit on the bus, she made a statement not just about where people can sit on the bus, 
It's about the entire system that enforces this apartheid, that enforces this segregation, this, this discrimination. So if you don't get the significance of why the hijab has to be completely free, you don't get the significance of what, why women have to be free, why the society at large has to be free. Also, it really goes to the heart of religious freedom, and religious freedom, as our founding fathers knew, is the, put it, the first, first clause of the First Amendment of the Constitution is the cornerstone for other freedoms. So uh, freedom of speech is uh, very much tied to religious freedom and the blasphemy laws. Even ayatollahs have been imprisoned for um, apostasy and blasphemy uh, violations because they dare to challenge clerical rule and whether that was fundamentally Islamic or not. Um, OK, in the back there. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Amir Atamadi. Uh, regarding what Mariam said about uh, National uh, Iranian American Council, NIAC, uh, recently, Shirin Abadi, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, did an interview with uh, uh, Bloomberg and said uh, she regrets uh, for uh, p uh, participating in NIAC, NIAC event in 2011. Uh, she said uh, Nayak actually is uh, close to closer to Iranian go government than Iranian what Iranian pe people want. Uh, now my question is for Miss Carr, but uh, any comments from Mariam and Masi uh, would be appreciated. Uh, do you agree with your uh, old friend and uh, old colleague uh, about what he, what she said uh, about Nayak and? Uh, uh, do you uh, also re do you also regret for do you also regret for for participating in NIAC event in 2013? Thank you. Yes, I had a speech about human rights in NIAC in 2013. Uh, my speech was about uh, everything and every violations against human rights in Iran, and it was nothing. My speech was not close to their policies that I don't know what is that exactly. And it doesn't mean if Shirin Ebadi, who got award from Nayak, and now she is saying that, OK, uh, I changed my mind, and I'm sorry, or something like that. I'm not ready to say such a thing. I didn't get award. I got a very good opportunity in Nayak in 2013 for talking about violation of human rights in Iran. And any tribune that gave me opportunity for talking against violation of human rights in Iran, I go and talk on that tribune and use that tribune. Okay. Okay. So can I add something? You know, let me, uh, can I add something? Um, for when I left Iran, these people from Nayak, they were really proud of me. I was their hero. They invited me to go and give a talk. I didn't go because I was in London. I didn't have the opportunity to go there. But why I was their hero? Because I was the one breaking the story of 57 people who got killed in 2009 election. I was the one breaking the story of a lot of political prisoners when Ahmadinejad was in power. I haven't changed. The government of Iran has changed. The moderate president is power. So I haven't done anything wrong. But these people now, they hate me. I'm not their hero anymore. So that actually shows you that when human rights get involved in politics, then you cannot claim that you're supporting the people of Iran. So what Nayak has been doing to me is just an example that a lot of politicians doing the same. When they are in power, they are warning people for breaking you know, the story of those people who are suffering from oppression. And then when the, pre the moderate president won the battle, when they are in power, and they keep you silent. 
That is why we have to make it clear. When we talk about human rights, we shouldn't care who is in power. Donald Trump, Ayatollah Khamenei, President Rouhani, or Ahmadinejad. If you really care about human rights, think about it. Hijab is the wall. Behind that, there are many other rights that have been taken away from us. Yeah. And as I said that, these governments, when they tell the high representative of the European Parliament what to wear, they're going to tell you how to behave, what to do. They're going to control everything. So when you bring this wall down, the rest will get easier. So hijab is the most visible symbol of oppression against women. Do not keep, you know, I want to just make it clear that when we invite people ask, so how we can help, how we can help, the most important thing is do not legitimize a discriminatory law. This is not a big demand. You know, when we ask all the female politicians, when you go to Iran, talk about your own dignity. When we see a picture of Federico Mogherini, Catherine Ashton, all the you know, feminists wearing hijab and saying that, you know, this is, the, this is the law. Slavery used to be legal. How you can respect a law which violates against the rights of women? And that is a simple demand. When you ask what we want, do not legitimize a discriminatory law. When the president of Iran is here in CNN, Channel 4, Le Monde, Figaro, all the newspaper around the world giving them opportunity to talk about human rights, ask the women of Iran do the, why these people are lying. Do not accept beautiful smile. That's all we want. We don't want Donald Trump come and save us. We are not the victims. We are the victorious. Mm -hmm. We are not the one waiting for all the discriminatory laws to be removed. No, we remove all the discriminatory laws. But when you empowering the government of Iran, they can put pressure on us. That's what we want you to do. You know, when I get this question, how we can help you, I said, you know, don't help me, but just don't help the government of Iran. Mm. That's all I want. Mm. When I was interviewing a cleric, the last thing that I want to say. The clerics told me on the phone, I'm, I'm really well known to interview all the clerics, just giving them a call saying that this is Massey, I want to talk to you. <laughs> I asked him simple question about his job. You know what he said? See Federico Mogrini. <laughs> she, you know, respect our culture. Who are you daring asking all the women to break the law and misrespect the culture of Iran? And, and that breaks my heart. Because it shows that they're using you to put more pressure on the women of Iran. Mm -hmm. Let's stand together. This is all I want. Doesn't matter who is in power. Think about human rights the way as it is. That's it. On that note, thank you so much. <laughs> all three of you were excellent. And um, there's an opportunity.